Thank you for the introduction. And hi, everyone. I'm here to present our work on Fox. And this is a collaboration with Moyang from IIT, as well as my advisor, Ravi, from uh, UCLA. So I don't probably have to convince you uh, that mobile setting dominates the global web traffic today. And in these settings, uh, there is a strong incentive to deliver fast page loads uh, because users are very sensitive to these delays and content providers have a lot to lose if their pages are slow. <clears throat> so, of course, there has been a lot of work done to try and improve mobile web performance in various ways. However, if you look at the standard uh, page load process shown on the right, existing optimizations mainly focus on the latter stages of the page load process. More specifically, they all ignore the fundamental bottleneck, which is the download of the top-level HTML. So let's zoom into that and see what happens there and why is it important. When users navigate to a page, the browser first has to download the page's top-level HTML. And to do so, the browser has to uh, first perform a DNS lookup to find the server. Then it has to uh, set up a TCP connection and potentially a TLS connection if the page is HTTPS. And only after performing these tasks and incurring the associated network round trips, it can send the request to the server. So from there, the server also has to incur a processing delay in order to uh, generate or locate the corresponding response before sending it back to the client. And so collectively, these tasks can sum up to hundreds of milliseconds, particularly in mobile setting. And unfortunately, during this time, on the client side, uh, the CPU is entirely idle and the screen is blank. <clears throat> and so what can we really do about this? At some level, the browser has to fetch content in order to render anything on the screen. And so to understand our options, we turn to mobile applications, which despite sharing so many components with a mobile web like devices, network, or content, they're actually able to deliver better performance and lower startup times. And to better understand these discrepancies between these two platforms, we compared uh, the time to first paint uh, <clears throat> or the time until first application pixels are painted on the screen for mobile app home screen and mobile web home page. And so we consider 10 popular web services. And here, uh, since apps cache content during installation, to have a fair comparison, we uh, evaluated warm page loads. And we found that apps uh, are able to deliver between three to five times lower time to first paint values than web pages. And here are uh, some screenshots uh, showing a representative example of how BBC News service works. As you can see, the app is able to very quickly render content on the screen at about 300 milliseconds, while the web page is still blank well past one second into the load. And so to understand why, let's dig a little bit deeper into how each of these platforms uh, are working. So mobile apps start by caching things like layout templates and logo images that define the basic visual structure of the app. Then when users want to load the app, the app immediately uh, sends a request to get the latest dynamic content, like latest headlines, and while it's waiting for the response, it then uh, renders the cache content to the screen. And when the dynamic content comes back, the app uses it to patch the screen and load uh, the final UI. So really, uh, there are two key ideas here. First, apps very aggressively cache content. And second, they parallelize the rendering and processing of these cache content with the fetches of dynamic content. Now, let's uh, take a look at web pages. As a first step, uh, the browser sends a request to get the top level HTML. And until that HTML is downloaded and parsed, the browser will not render any of its cached or dynamic content to the screen. And so if we take a look uh, at the app optimization principles again, the web actually satisfies the first one. 
Since most objects are cacheable, however, it fails to satisfy the second one. The reason is uh, browsers cannot render any of the cached content until the, <coughs> sorry, until the top level HTML is downloaded and parsed. And the reason is that top level HTML files dictate the page compositions, uh, but unfortunately, these HTMLs are typically uncacheable because they bundle together the static and dynamic content. So the result of this is that the significant amount of caching on web pages ends up having minimal uh, impact on time to first paint. For instance, improvements are only 5% at the median. And so naturally, we asked whether the existing web pages are amenable to this kind of uh, app like templating. And to answer this, we analyzed the HTML files for 500 pages over the course of a day. And to simplify this analysis, we represent HTMLs as trees where each node is labeled with a tag type, a set of attribute, and a body. And we found that despite being uncacheable, HTML content remains largely unchanged over time. And from this, we concluded that the existing web pages are already amenable to this kind of templating. And so to exploit this observation without modifying browsers or manually rewriting pages, we built Fox. So here I'm going to explain a high level overview of how Fox works in both cold and warm cache settings before describing uh, its components in more details. So let's take a look at the cold cache case. To start offline, Fox first identifies the possible HTML versions for a given page. And then it passes those files to its static template generator, which outputs a static template HTML that lists the common parts between those files. And then when a client wants to load a page, they send a standard HTTPS request to the server, which immediately responds back with the static template. And as client is parsing this template, uh, the default web server is generating a target HTML that it would have normally served to the client without Fox. And so <clears throat> after that, Fox generates what we call a dynamic patch, which lists the operations that are required to convert the static template into the target HTML. And as soon as the patch is generated, it is sent back to the client so that it can finish its page load. The warm cache case follows a similar pattern, but here the browser starts with this static template in its cache along with other standard cacheable resources like images and CSS. So when user requests a page, the browser will immediately send an asynchronous request to get the most updated dynamic patch from the server while parsing the static template. And so the patch generation on the server works in the exact same way as before. And again, as soon as the dynamic patch is generated, it is sent back to the client. So of course, uh, there are a bunch of challenges that we need to address in order to realize Fox architecture. In particular, we need to develop and apply <coughs> new techniques to generate and apply both templates and patches. In the interest of time, in this talk, I'm going to mostly focus on questions two to four, but the paper provides details about how we can use static program analysis techniques to efficiently get the possible HTML versions or files for a given page. Now, let's just start with the second question. Um, so given the possible HTML versions for a page, the goal of our static template generator is to extract the maximum amount of shared content between them. And to do this, we use a slight variation of tree matching algorithm Given two input uh, HTML trees, it outputs the number of operations uh, to transform the first tree into the second tree. 
And using these operations, which highlight the differences between the trees, we can find their similarities. So in our tree matching algorithm, we have the standard insert and delete operations, but we introduce a new merge operation, which allows us to modify attributes and body of a node, but not the tag type. The reason is because the tag types have impact on the downstream HTML, and so if we change the tag types, that could trigger errors. So let's look at an example. As an example, given these two HTML trees, our altered tree matching algorithm returns three operations. Delete node A, and then merge node a span to update the ID attribute, and the only thing left is to insert the image tag, and that gives us the second tree. Now, we can use these operations to generate our static template by removing any content that is not shared between the two trees. So to do this, we start with the first uh, tree and we apply delete operations to remove any uh, nodes that are not in the second tree. And we also remove the attributes and body content that are part of a merge operation, since those represent content that have values that are different in the two trees. And finally, we can ignore the insert operations, since those are inherently for content that are not in the first tree. And so in this example, we'd be left with this tree. But can we call this our static template? Well, the answer is no. So the reason has to do with the execution of JavaScript in the static template. The challenge is that JavaScript code in a page can access HTML state using browser built-in methods. And so, for example, here, in the original HTML, the script could call a method like get element by ID x to obtain a reference uh, to the span tag. However, with Fox, templates are parsed to completion before or while dynamic patches are downloaded to avoid blocking delays. As a result, in the static template, the script's call to get element by ID would return null because we stripped the ID attribute from the span tag. And now this could change or break the rest of the page. And so we want our static templates to be internally consistent from the perspective that the JavaScript code in the template should, re should not rely on any HTML state that is going to be added by a patch. And so to make sure of that, we delete all the script tags after the first edit, which gives us the finalized static template. Now that we have our templates, the next set of challenges have to do with Fox patches. So let's just start uh, with how to generate them. Our goal here is to generate a list of operations that can transform the static template into the latest HTML. And a natural approach would be to use the same uh, tree matching algorithm that we saw before to generate such a list. But these algorithms uh, take seconds to run, which is far too slow uh, to be done during the client page loads. So by analyzing how HTML files evolve over time, we found that even though content changes exist, tags almost never move across levels in the trees. And so this enabled us to closely approximate tree matching algorithms using a breadth-first heuristic. This approach essentially trades off patch generation time with the number of operations in the patch. And we found that this trade-off is quite favorable as we are able to cut the runtime by several orders of magnitude while experiencing only 1% more operation. Importantly, I want to note that this suboptimality does not affect uh, correctness as these operations will still result in the target HTML even if they take a slightly inefficient path. And the paper describes the heuristic in detail, but at a high level, we essentially step through the two trees 
comparing only nodes that are on the same level. So the last challenge is how we can apply patches during client page loads. <coughs> to apply patches, Fox includes a custom JavaScript library in its template and the library immediately issues an asynchronous request to get the dynamic patch and it registers a handler for applying this patch once it's arrived. The challenge here arises from the interaction of JavaScript code with the live HTML state. More formally, during the page load, the browser builds a live internal representation of HTML3, which is called the DOM tree. And the JavaScript code can interact with this DOM tree using a DOM interface, which exposes method for both obtaining references to DOM nodes or modifying the tree. And so this interaction poses numerous challenges. Most notably, the main challenge here is ensuring correctness by providing what we call view invariance for JavaScript code that is applied to the pa page by a patch. And so view invariance means that JavaScript code should observe the exact same DOM state as it would have seen in the default page load, despite the fact that the downstream HTML content in the template would have already loaded. For example, consider a case where the browser has um, parsed this template and has downloaded a dynamic patch. Now suppose that the dynamic patch inserts a script in the middle of the template, which calls a method uh, that returns all the images in this page. If executed normally, uh, this will return two images, whereas the red one would not have been observable to the script during a default page load. And so to, to avoid these errors, Fox uses novel shims or wrappers around DOM methods that JavaScript can use to read from the DOM tree and so in these schemes, Fox first uh, calls the native method, but before returning the value, uh, it prunes the output according to a boundary that it infers based on how browsers parse the HTML. And essentially, any node below this boundary is pruned out before the response is returned. And so now that we have our system, uh, let's look at some of our evaluation results. We consider top uh, 500 Alexa pages over both Wi-Fi and LTE, and we used Mahi Mahi for recording a page at different times and replaying it as it would have been seen by Fox. So we compared to a, a default page load and we considered three different metrics. Time to first pane, as I mentioned before, the page load time, which is the time until the page is fully loaded in the browser, and speed index, which is an um, <coughs> the average time at which visible parts of the page are displayed. So we measured each of these metrics in different settings when a page is loaded back to back and when page loads are 12 hours apart over both Wi-Fi and LT network. And we found that Fox was able to provide significant benefits across all of these settings and metrics. For example, we see 67% improvement for time to first pane 17% for page load time, and 38% for speed index over LT network. And we also provide benefit in cold cache settings, although they are less pronounced, because Fox has to pay network penalties to download its template. For example, um, the speed index improvements are 24% over LT network. In conclusion, I've presented Fox, and the source code for Fo Fox can be found at the link on the slide. With that, I conclude, and I'm happy to take any questions. Questions? Hello. Hi. Uh, Vishwanath from Emory. So I understand that you guys are working with legacy websites and stuff, but how often did you see a change in structure or content which led to like cache invalidation in the hot scenario? So most of the pages do not change uh, that much over time. Mm -hmm. For instance, uh, as you could see, even the changes are like between levels of tree are not that much common, but um, Paper provides detail on how we generate these static templates. I, I think your question goes back to that. Okay. And um, so basically, uh, based on the different approaches that we take, um, uh, we can take care of the changes in the static template. Okay. But 
The important thing is that even if the page changes, like the, like the server changes new target HTML, uh, Fox still works correctly with a stale template. Thank you. Yeah, very clever uh, work. Um, I wanted, it seems like there's some risk that uh, brittle behavior, which I realize you tried to work around by pruning the tree. Did you make any measurement of whether the semantics or behavior of the pages was different on the ones you tested? Um, so you mean the JavaScript uh, execution yeah, did, of the page when you're right. patching Did that ever right. behave differently? So uh, we made sure that you're doing this correctly uh, by comparing a, like a default page that's like not using yeah, Fox yeah. versus the Fox version, and we uh, looked at the uh, like pixel. We analyzed the pixel values and JavaScript heap uh, and the DOM trees, and we made sure that they are equal to each other. 